thinking as we're singing of Moses before the children of Israel at the edge of that Red Sea, where Moses told them, he said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, right? They followed God's leading in obedience. They were at the edge of an impossible situation, and Moses called them to, to faith, right? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And that ought to be our approach to life, right? Every day, to stand still and see God work his salvation in our lives. Amen? Amen. Well, you know where we'll be this morning. He, uh, <laughs> I don't know where I'll be this morning, apparently. <laughs> Second Peter, chapter 2, not sure where Hebrews came from. But 2 Peter chapter 2, that's better. A little short break last week, and um, this week we pick up in our study of 2 Peter here. And chapter 2, this is going to end up being a four-part series, chapter 2, that we're calling exposing false teachers and that's exactly what peter is doing in this second chapter he is making the case against uh, false teachers two weeks ago as we explored verses four through nine we saw peter making the case for the judgment of god against false teachers he pointed to three specific examples of God's wrath against those who rebelled against God's authority. And he speaks of their sin, their ungodliness, their filthy conversation. And he draws the parallel here between those who God judged in the past for those things and these who God will judge in the future for their sin, for their ungodliness, and their filthy conversation. The argument that he makes is that if God did not spare them, then we can be sure that God knows, as he says in verse 9, how to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. In our text this morning, verses 10 through 16, Peter zeroes in on their specific behaviors. And he shows those behaviors to be especially egregious and deserving of what he refers to in verse 1, swift destruction or judgment of God. So follow along as I read verses 10 through 16. But chiefly then that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise governments, Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not. And shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, Following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we examine this descriptive and startling passage of scripture, we acknowledge, dear God, the importance of it 
We ask that your Holy Spirit would unfold that importance to our hearts and minds. Lord, help us to faithfully and humbly listen to your word this morning and to receive all that you have for us. Lord, we don't want to leave this place without your Holy Spirit having impacted our hearts. And so we pray that you would be hard at work in our hearts and minds this morning. Thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Interesting passage of scripture this morning. And we're exposing false teachers through the words of Peter as written and inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. I'd like you to consider five characteristics of these false teachers that Peter gives us uh, in this section of chapter 2. He gives us kind of a rough outline of who and what they are in verses 1 through 3, and then verses 4 through 9, as we said, he speaks of their judgment. But now he kind of fills in the blanks, and he brings color to their sinful lives. And we see in verse 10, number one, we see this characteristic of self-serving. Self-serving. They are a self-serving group of people. He says in verse 10, but chiefly, them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. That word chiefly at the beginning of verse 10 shows, Peter is showing the factors that especially draw God's wrath to these false teachers. Chiefly, notice in verse 9, let's tie it in with verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. He also knows, get this, how to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly, these false teachers. Because they walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government, they're presumptuous, they're self-willed. The individual he will go on to describe here in these verses is the kind of individual who God, especially or chiefly, knows how to reserve to judgment. He first describes them as flesh pleasers. The contaminated desires of the flesh are that which they pursue. He says they walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. The contaminated desires of the flesh. That's what they're after. That's what they're pursuing. They may purport to speak the word of God. They may say they, they, they may say, thus saith the Lord, but in their heart there is nothing but contaminated desires of the flesh. And that is all that they're after. We'll see that in a more uh, 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 colorful way as we work our way through this passage. But Peter exposes them. They are walking after the flesh. Their flesh is controlled by the lust of uncleanness. Their manner of living is talking about. It's consumed by getting and doing what satisfies the corrupted longings of the sin nature. You know what I'm talking about. We all have those lusts of uncleanness. of God, Lord willing, you know what they are in your life, and by God's grace and with the help of His Holy Spirit, you're in battle against those. But not these. These false teachers are in hot pursuit of their contaminated desires. Notice how he goes on to describe them. He says they despise government. In other words, he is calling them rebels. They're rebels. They despise government. The idea in the original language is they think against those in authority. The word translated government is the word used for masters or lords. It's not speaking, uh, it, it's being used here in a general sense, not limited to political governments. Any 
uh, manifestation of authority in their lives, they're against. They despise it. They, uh, uh, they, they literally think against that authority. They live in opposition to the authority that God has put in their lives. They despise them as the rebels. He goes on in verse 10 to say, presumptuous are they. Presumptuous. In other words, they're bold in their self-serving lifestyle. They make no apology for their lust-filled uncleanness and the rebellion against authority. It's completely normal to them. And in fact, they think that it makes them look good, look powerful, look attractive. They're bold in their self-serving lifestyle. They function as if they have every right to conduct themselves in this manner. And then he says at the end of verse 10, or in the middle of verse 10 there, that they're self-willed. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. That's pretty self-explanatory for us. If you're a parent, you know what it means to be self-willed, right? You had to work on that with your kids, that self-willed thing. Truth is, all of us, have that tendency in our own hearts without the help of the Holy Spirit. But these are controlled by the will of self. They have one agenda, and that agenda doesn't have anything to do with serving anyone but themselves. There may be a facade of care and concern and of desire to help other people, but what lies underneath that facade, Peter says, is self-will. What they want and how they get it completely ignores the will and the way of God. It's interesting because in Titus chapter 1 verse 7 we're told the bishop must not be self-willed. Same word. Be the opposite of the false teacher. If you are an overseer of the church of God, do not be self-willed. But this is how the false teacher is. He is self-willed. He is all about his own agenda. So we see self-serving, number one. I'd like you to consider number two, slandering. Their way is a way of slandering. He says at the end of verse 10, they are not afraid to speak of to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts may be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, shall perish in their own corruption, shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. These are people characterized by slandering. That's the idea of verse 10, to speak evil. They're not afraid to speak evil. Here we get a glimpse of the speech of the false teacher. His speech, of course, flows from his heart attitude, which we just saw earlier in verse 10. And his speech is characterized by slandering. The word there is blasphemy. It's the kind of speech that vilifies that which is good, that which is right. They're not afraid to blaspheme. They're not afraid to slander. Notice how he says it. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. The word there is glorious. The word glory, it's used to describe the many ways in which God's splendor is revealed. They speak against God glorifying things in a slanderous way. They do so in a bold way. There's no fear in slandering that which God in his perfection has made glorious. And that, that's what self-will creates, right? A boldness that slanders what ought to be exalted. 
superior draws a contract to show this, the shocking nature of their slander. He says here, uh, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. What is he talking about? Well, we have cross-referenced with Jude quite a bit, as we've been in 2 Peter 2. But I'd like you to notice in Jude, verses 8 and 9, we have a similar statement. In fact, a specific example where he says in verse 8, likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion. And he says they speak evil of dignities, right? That's exactly what Peter said. And then he says in verse 9, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked him. What's he talking about? What does it mean he was contending with the devil, disputing about the body of Moses? Well, we're not really given the details to understand that in full. But the point here is that these false teachers speak evil of dignities when God's angels are afraid to do the same. He says, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, dispute about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him, against the devil, a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked him. So back in 2 Peter chapter 2, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels which are great in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. Just like Michael did not take upon himself the authority of rebuking Satan, but left that judgment to God, so here we see in verse 11, angels greater in power and might do not bring railing accusation against Satan them before the Lord. It's a sharp contrast because a false teacher speaks evil of dignities. An angel won't bring a railing accusation against a demon or the devil himself. He'll leave it to God to rebuke them. But by contrast, a false teacher will speak evil, blasting and slander that which is, glor it, it, it is glorified. Well, the angel's greater than false teacher in might and power. He understands his place of authority under God. He's not self willed He will not step over the bounds that God has designed for him. But not so for the false teacher. We continue in verse 12. But these, Peter says, as natural brute beasts, May to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. These false teachers, Peter says, are natural brute beasts. What is he talking about? He's calling them or likening them to animals. Why? Well, the word natural there has the idea of instinctive, right? living by instinct. That's the way animals live. They live by instinct. They do what God has instinctive, instinctively built into them to do. Natural. They're instinctive. The problem is the false teachers aren't living by instinct in terms of that which is right. They're living by the instincts of their own corrupted flesh. And so they're natural brute beasts. That word brute has the idea of being irrational. No logic, literally. Instinctive, illogical animals. What a harsh way to describe them, but that is exactly <laughs> the way they live. natural animal in the wild will live by his in instinct. He will seek out his prey and he will destroy. Because that's what he needs to do to survive. And that's what the false teacher does. Peter compares them to animals that have no logic but act instinctively. They're governed by purely fleshly impulses. 
And in a behavior, they're no better than the animals of the food chain who, in, in a sense, simply exist to be food for another animal, right? They slander things of which they are ignorant, Peter says. Verse 12, they speak evil of the things that they understand not. The utter arrogance of their hearts is on full display here. Notice in verse 12, he also says, they are made to be taken and destroyed. The idea there is that that's a natural cycle of life in the animal world, right? They live, and then eventually, I know we hate to think about this, you know, especially if you got a pet. <laughs> you hate to think about this, but that animal is food for another animal. They're made to be taken, to be snared, to be trapped and destroyed. And this is the kind of position that the false teacher has put himself into. Finally, in verse 12, we see a sad reality. <clears throat> As he says, they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. <clears throat> They'll utterly perish in their own corruption. In other words, their corruption, their lifestyle of corruption will be their own self-made trap that will bring their demise. trap themselves and bring themselves to destruction. And guess what? That destruction will be full and complete. As they say it, they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. It will bring them to a full and complete destruction. That's the nature of all that is self-made in arrogant, godless self-will. You see people crashing and burning, so to speak, around you and in this world that we live in, mark it down. <laughs> They've been living for a long time in arrogant self-will against God. That's the nature of it. They will utterly perish in their own corruption. Jude 10 says that they, that these speak evil of those things which they know not. <clears throat> but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corruptly, or they corrupt themselves. <clears throat> we read on in the beginning of verse 13, it says they, they shall utterly perish their own corruption and they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. What are you talking about there? You're talking about what we saw in verses 4 through 9. God will bring their punishment upon them. There, they are assured punishment for sin from God as well. Not only will they bring themselves to destruction, their own corruption, but God will punish them. There's always a reward for unrighteousness, and it will be needed out of them. And so we see, number one, we see self-serving. Number two, we see slandering. I'd like you to notice the second part of verse 13. We see sporting. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about sporting? Well, read along with me. They receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that counted pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Notice how he says that they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. There is those that judge it to be to be desirous to live loosely in the light of day. That's what that word riot means. I know we have images from the news conjure up in our minds when we hear that word riot. But the old English word riot has the idea, and it ties directly in with what we see on the news, of living loosely, wanton pleasure, no restraints, no regards for anything or anybody, rioting. 
and as they that counted pleasure to riot. But not just to riot, to riot in the daytime. What does he mean? What most would reserve for the night, or what most would try to cover up and hide in their own lives, these do out in the public. They do brazenly in the daylight. There's no shame. There's no control. There's no discretion in their lives. They bring shame. He says spots they are in blemishes. They are dirty spots as they revel in their deception in public among believers. Notice how he says it. They are sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. In other words, they're actively engaged in fellowship with God's people. And all the while they are openly spouting. Maybe that's the word I should have used instead of sporting. Spouting, that's what it means. They're promoting their own thoughts and ideas, their own deceptions. With no shame. Jude describes them this way. They, these are spots in your feasts of charity. As you can tell, these would have been fellowship gatherings where God's people would come together and they would eat and they would break bread together. And apparently these false teachers were a part of it. They infiltrated and Jude says, these are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. They have no shame. They're brazen in what they do. And so we see they're sporting. In other words, they're promoting themselves and their false ideas. In verse 14, we see a subverting having eyes full of adultery and that, and, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls in heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. You see here a, a subverting. Their hearts, uh, Peter says, are filled with adulterous thoughts and desires, and it's manifest in the lack of control of their eyes. Everything that is licentious, everything that that is uh, 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 that that has to do with fornication or that which is sexually impure and immoral, they're laser focused on. Their eyes, he says, are full of adultery. He says they cannot cease from sin. They're engulfed in it. Their sin is so ingrained in them that it is habitual with no help, or excuse me, no hope of an end. They're completely loose and wanton in their sin. They drown in their sin. They cannot cease from it, Peter says. Notice what else he says. They beguile unstable souls. The word beguile there, of course, means to deceive, to draw away. Who are they looking for? They're looking for those who are unstable in their faith, those who are weak in their faith. Let me tell you something. Christian, if you are weak in your faith, you better watch out. You better grow up. You better mature. Because there are those who are seeking to beguile you. There are those who are seeking to draw you in to their error and to their licentious, greedy, self-willed lifestyle. Their goal is to deceive those who are not firm in their faith. They are seeking a following. Why? For their own self-serving agenda. You're a tool. You're a means to an end. In fact, in verse 2 of this chapter we read, 
when they bring in damnable heresies, many shall follow their pernicious ways, and through covetousness, they will, with vain words, make merchandise of you. And he echoes that here in verse 14 when he says, They are beguiling unstable souls. Then he says, With covetous, or they, he says, They have in heart that they have exercised with covetous practices. That word exercise <laughs> was used in the Greek world in that, in that uh, physical sense. Right? Working out. But here we see that they are exercising themselves with covetous practices. It's all about them. In other words, these people are greedy to the greatest extent. They are filled with greed. They are they, they have become masters at serving their own hearts of grief. They have, they, they have exercised themselves toward that greed. They become good at it. They become good at achieving all that they want and all that they desire. How else could they beguile unstable souls? They're greedy. They're covetous. And then he drops a name upon them. Verse, at the end of verse 14. Cursed children. Cursed children. Were they cursed by? Well, we saw that in verses 4 through 9. Judgment is coming. They receive the reward of their unrighteousness. They're cursed children. They're headed for the judgment of God. He's already placed his mark upon them because of their wickedness for his judgment. And so we see, number one, a self-serving. We see a slandering. We see a sporting and subverting. I'd like you to notice lastly in verses 15 and 16, I'd like you to notice straying. He says, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. Straying. They turn their back on what is right and have left it, walking in the other direction. And that direction is the same direction that Balaam took. Remember Balaam? Peter uses him here as an illustration. Jude uses him as an illustration as well. Balaam. Balaam was a prophet in Israel who went astray. You can read Numbers 22 through 24 to learn of Balaam. He was a prophet in Israel, a prophet of God, but he went astray. The king of Moab offered to pay him handsomely to, for, to prophesy a curse upon God's people. <coughs> Balaam refused. In fact, he refused multiple times. He said, I can only speak that which is good. I can only prophesy a blessing upon God's people. But it seems that he was only refusing to get the king of Moab to offer him more money. He repeatedly told the king that he would only prophesy a blessing upon Israel, but it seems that it was all a cover for what Peter calls here a love of the wages of unrighteousness. Money was Balaam's agenda. And even though he was saying he wouldn't prophesy a curse against Israel, it apparently was his intention because we find that God had to stop him. He was going with the leaders of Moab, and God put an angel in his path. He didn't see the angel, but his donkey did and wouldn't move. There was no way to pass. He became angry, and he hit the donkey, and what did God do? God spoke through that donkey to rebuke him for what Peter refers to as his madness. Notice in verse 15, excuse me, verse 16. He was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice, 
or bad, the badness of the prophet. In other words, that word literally means to be out of out of your mind, to be beside your mind. He was mad with greed. He was filled with greed. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. What happens with the covetous, greedy, self will intentions of false teachers? They are revealed to be fools in their errant state. Boy, did Balaam look like a fool. When God stopped him, Balaam looked like a fool. He was running headlong after his own greed and covetousness, and God used a stupid donkey stop him in his tracks, to awaken him out of his madness. And these false teachers are revealed to be fools in the same way in their erring state. They've gone after the prophet of ungodliness, which in the end is no prophet but extreme loss. So we see their strain. Nobody ever starts out to be a false prophet. But when you go after your own will in your own way, when you're covetous and greedy in your heart, when you allow your own pride to blind your eyes and to dull your heart, you end up straying. So we have a clear picture, a scripted picture that Peter gives us in verses 10 through 16 of these false teachers. What was it that they were teaching? What was it they, that they were preaching? We don't know what their agenda was. We don't know what they were specifically teaching that was false. And while we know that not everything described here described every false teacher, we know the basic motivations they all have. And this provides for every believer the basic framework with which we can discern false teachers. With publications, radio, television, the internet, false teaching is now more, more than ever pervasive and accessible to you and me. In other words, discernment is now needed more than ever in the world in which we live by God's people. We must discern men and, yes, sadly, women who twist the word of God. We must be driven by God's truth and not by our emotions and feelings. That's how they forgot it track your emotions and your feelings. We must not be taken with words and with personalities. We must be taken with finding out what God has said. It's got to be more important to you and me than our feelings, than a person, than a movement. I'd like you to consider this second application as well. Not only is it important for the believer to look at this passage and use it to discern false teachers, but you must use it to discern your own heart and life. At the root of who these people are is a proud, self-pleasing heart attitude. And if the kind of behavior described here flows from such a heart attitude, then you and I must be aware of it in us. As you read through this, you say, wow. What a group of people. Wow, what wickedness. But folks, where did it start? <laughs> Was it always this way in their lives? Or did it start with a little root of pride hidden deep under the surface of their hearts and minds? At the root of who these people are is a proud, self-pleasing heart attitude. The kind of behavior described here flows from such an heart attitude. You and I must be aware of it in our own minds. Often we look at the important behavior of others and we fail to realize that it always grows from the soil of a proud and rebellious heart against God. 
And you and I fail to do what God has told us to do. When you and I fail to deal with something in our own hearts and lives that God has told us to deal with, he's pointed it out as sin, and we refuse to get it right, mark it down, you're on the same path that they started out. We have to examine our own hearts. James gives us the best help to avoid such a heart. He says in chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. That's the contrast. We need to draw in our own hearts and lives against these that Peter describes in 2 Peter chapter 2. May it never be said of you and I that we have become a people that are self serving, slandering, sporting. Subverting or strain. May God give us grace to discern in the lives of others and discern in our own lives as well. Lord, we just ask you to speak. manifest yourselves to us today. I pray that your spirit would do such a work in our hearts that we would bow humbly before you and we allow you to have your will and your way in this morning. Show us, dear God, where we are going our own way. Show us, Lord, where we have risen up in our hearts against your will in your way. Show us, Lord, where we have been covetous and greedy, where we have allowed the corruption of the flesh to rule and to reign in our lives. And I pray your Holy Spirit would reign all of that in transform us, Lord, to look like Jesus. We ask for your help in this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed as the music is played? Would you bow your heart low before the Lord? Would you do whatever business is necessary in your heart?